Hello and welcome to Real Stories, the only show on the box where you get the chance to have a gander through the lives of your favourite pop stars as we get the inside stories from those that know them best. Think of us as a proud mum showing you all the snaps in the family photo album, the ones they'd wish had burnt in that fire. And up today, it's the girl next door with the really loud voice. There's a fire starting in my heart. To be perfectly frank, she was a little bit lazy. At that time, she was a little bit grungy. Cigarette in one hand, cannabis in the other. The second call, they say, he's a doubt there, he's a doubt there. She literally was like a thousand lines. I have goosebumps from head to toe. The toilets are disgusting, and she swore a lot. Over the next hour, get ready for the real story of Adele, the greatest British musical export of the last decade. But, as well as hearing her fine cockney twang, we'll also be hearing the equally enticing tongues of these two lovely people next to me. The editor of Heat and knower of all that's juicy, <laughs> it's Lucy Cave. Lucy, I trust the bacon sign is going down well. It's been better days. Marvellous. And celebrity and entertainment columnist for the Sunday Mirror, and lover of all things that go pop, Dean Piper. Oh, 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 I was hungry. Okay, fine. Uh, now, this show is not for the faint-hearted. There will be heartbreaking moments. There will be bleep swearing, and there will be more cackling than a broomstick convention. So let's get started with a crash course in Adele's childhood. Everybody ready? Good, let's go. I will be asking questions afterwards. Adele Laurie Blue Atkins was born 5th of May 1988 to parents Penny and Mark in the North London borough of Tottenham, an area otherwise famous for its local football club, being the birthplace of esteemed entertainers like Lamar and Cat Moon, and yes, of course, the odd riot or two. Adele lives happily with both her parents until Dad Mark leaves when she's aged just three, leaving her to be raised by her mum, grandparents and a close-knit family. She dreams of becoming either a brain surgeon or a fashion reporter, but mum Penny always has Expected her girl was destined for bigger and better things than mere neurological surgery. Well, Adele's mum encouraged her to perform from a very early age for sort of friends and family. So maybe from the age of five, she'd be standing on the kitchen table. Her mum used to arrange all the lamps in the room to sort of shine a spotlight on Adele when she was performing, crooning like Tom Jones. <laughs> Her mother is a huge influence on her, introducing her to all kinds of music and takes her to her first gig at London's Finsbury Park to see 80s goth legends The Cure. But she still finds time to listen to other favourites. Spice Girl, I often very much always wanted to be a Spice Girl. I feel like one today. Great. Spice Girls were a very big part of my life. Lee said about that, the better. Over the next few years, she moves around London with her mum before ending up in Brixton and attends the Chestnut Grove School in Balham, where she's taught by deputy head teacher Dominic Bergen. Well, I first met Adele in uh, 2000 when I joined the school, and uh, she would be in year eight then, I think. Um, and my memories of her are that she was, uh, she was a really lovely girl. She was kind of friendly, she was bubbly. Um, at that time, she was a little bit grungy. But her teachers don't quite share her vision of becoming a world-conquering pop juggernaut and aren't keen to put their mortgages on her becoming the school's most famous pupil. It would be fair to say that, that we didn't kind of pin her down as, as a kind of future star. That she was always a really big personality. Um, after her first album came out, I think it was, uh, my wife, who was her English teacher, and I saw her in Covent Garden. And she kind of ran over and screamed and gave her a hug. So she was a, she was a personality. But no, we wouldn't have necessarily said that she was going to be a great star. Yeah, I mean, all those dreams of performing at the Royal Albert Hall were just pie in the sky, weren't they? I'd just like to go on record as saying that I am totally loving the deputy head shirt and tie combo. <laughs> I wish Mr. Simmons at my school had the taste and, dare I say, the panache to pull that off back in the day. Um, now, Lucy, we've just seen how Adele's mum introduced her to a lot of music, but how vital is her family? There are many things that I love about Adele, and one of them is the fact that she's just still such a homebody, and she talks so openly about her mum. I mean, obviously her dad left her at a young age, and so she didn't really have much of a relationship with her dad, but she grew up with her mum and 
pretty much a single parent, and they're like best mates. Bless her. I mean, I love that about her. I had the great honour of uh, breaking the news to Adele that she'd sold something like 40 billion records or whatever it was. And I said, what are you going to do with the money? And she went, oh, my mum spotted this really swanky saucepan, so I'm going to get her those. <laughs> and I said, what about yourself? What are you going to treat yourself to? She went, maybe I might get some paragliding lessons. <laughs> I didn't see that one coming. Um, Dean, we all know that she's a proud London girl, but why do you think her manner has been so important in shaping who she is today? I think it's been really important where she was brought up. So I think Tottenham and that London manner, it's very old school. It's kind of like, you know, your neighbours next door saying, you want to come over for tea and we'll do fish fingers? You know, it's all kind of that. Hey, I do the impressions on this show. I know, well, I'm going to be doing a lot too. <laughs> but she's always stuck with what she grew up with. And not many people will do that. And I think she's just kept her feet very firmly on the ground, thanks to the people around her. Up next, we're back on the streets of London, but heading a little further south towards the pleasure dome that is Croydon. More specifically, the Brit School. So let me see those jazz hands, kids. There we go, Dee. No tap dancing on the table, stop it. You know what you like, you know what you like. Ah, ah. Realising she's a lot better at singing and playing the guitar than studying, she decides to apply for a place at the famed Brit School. If we'd have known what we know now, then obviously, you know, we would have kind of nurtured her, persuaded her not to go to the Brits, but unfortunately we didn't spot her a fantastic potential um, when she was in year 7, 8 or 9. The Croydon Brit School has an impressive curricular conveyor belt that has spewed out the likes of Leona Lewis, Jessie J, Rizzle Kicks, Katie B, Katie Mellower, the Noisettes, and of course the school's most famous protege. No, not her. Ah, oh, there we go. Amy Winehouse. To get accepted, Adele had to go through a strenuous interview. I first met Adele when she was 13. She came to the school for an audition for the Music Strand. She performed for us both as a vocalist and. Um, I don't know if she wants anyone to know this, but um, as a clarinetist as well, she played a bit of clarinet. Was she going to get through? Was she going to get the place? Of course she was. It's Adele for crying out loud. It was an easy yes decision and she got a place on the Key Stage 4 course, so arrived when she was 14. Once in, she moves into a flat above a pound shop in West Norwood and soon becomes one of the school's most popular characters. My favourite memory of Adele would definitely be seeing her in her tracksuit bottoms in the corner of the foyer at Brit School, playing a rugged guitar. Not a care in the world. Everybody would just be like, oh, there's Adele playing another song. Do you know what I mean? It was just a nice vibe and she always created a nice vibe wherever she was and everybody wanting to be her friend because she was just so amazing. She had finally found her calling. She later said of the school, It was a bit like fame sometimes. You get people doing their ballet stretches and singers having sing-offs, but I'd rather that than someone pulling out a knife. There was always just a few little stars that twinkled a little bit brighter than everybody else and she was definitely one of them. And she didn't get blinded by all of the industry side of things and that is very much of a front at Brit School and everybody thinks that it's like some fame school but she just loves the music. Sometimes she was quite studious and got her head down and got on, on with her work and other times and to be perfectly frank she was a little bit lazy. I think she, yeah she was just always in a world of her own. I remember her walking around school without any sense of urgency to get anywhere. One time we took a group of students down to Devon and we were all meeting at Clapham Junction Station. The train was due about half past nine and about 25 past nine we got a phone call from Adele. She'd just woken up. So she missed the train and she didn't come to Devon for four days. And when I last saw her she said, oh I'm just still so gutted about that that I didn't make it. Don't worry Liz, I'm sure with all the records she's now sold she's over the disappointment of not going to Devon. H hang on. We're getting some news in. Yes, it's official. Adele has bought Devon. Uh, Lu Lucy, did you have Adele down as a good student, a bad student? We're hearing that she was a mixed bag, but what were you thinking? I imagine her as a good student, but it doesn't surprise me that she's quite lazy. I think it's that's again part of her charm because she just taps to the teenager and everyone who just imagine we're going, oh, I can't be bothered to get out of bed today. <laughs> she obviously. It's so naturally talented, but she just couldn't be bothered sometimes. Um, Dean, we must talk about the Brit School, the institution that is single-handedly keeping the British music industry afloat. I think the music industry definitely follows what the Brit School does. They look at the emerging talent. You know, you only have to look at the people that have been there to realise how much of an influence it is. Because they actually learn every single part of the music industry. So it's not just turning up and going, oh, she's got a good voice. They're producing pop stars that have got meat to their bones. Absolutely. Um, OK, uh, it's time for a break now. But find out afterwards what happens when she gets a record deal, some creepy emails, and indirectly makes this man's mobile phone melt. 
Most of them think I'm a boyfriend, her, some ex-boyfriend that's done her a terrible wrong. My friend, do not try the black pudding. Welcome back to part two of Real Stories, where today in the cafe we're untangling the history of the Princess of Tottenham, Adele. And to help me, I've got the acquaintance of Heat Magazine's Lucy Cave and from the Sunday Mirror, Dean Piper. Oh. Okay, so the year is 2006. Take that, I've just announced their comeback. JT had just bought Sexy back, and Adele's just graduated and conquered, might I add, the Brit School. All she needs now is a record deal. After graduating from the Brit School, Adele records a rough demo tape of songs. A friend, realising how good they sound, sets up a MySpace page and posts the songs on her behalf. And within days, she's receiving numerous messages from labels and managers wanting to meet her. Exile had spotted these demos and thought, wow, you know, she's really got something. However, thinking they are just internet pervs, she chooses to ignore them. Thankfully, ultra cool label XL persevered and proved they weren't pervs, but purists. Nick Huggett managed to get through to her and said, well, are you signed? And she said, signed to what? And he said, have you got a record deal? At which point a penny dropped and she realised that XL were a genuine company, you know, the director of Dizzy Rascal, the White Stripes. She starts to get quite excited after that. She signs up to XL and manager Jonathan Dickens, who she goes with simply because he makes her laugh. <laughs> However, things don't take off as quickly as she'd hoped and she spends months sitting around doing nothing but watching Sex in the City. Eight months later, and with all 94 episodes of Carrie's antics under her belt, she meets Jim Abbas, the producer of her debut single, Hometown Glory. I first met Adele quite by chance. I was working with a friend of hers, um, a singer called Jack Pignate, and I said we need a female voice on this Jack. And about half an hour later, the studio door is just thrown open, and this big buxom, cockney girl, uh, larger than life character, cigarette in one hand, can of beer in the other, bowls into the studio. As soon as she started singing, uh, my jaw dropped. The, the first thing we ever recorded together was Hometown Glory which almost didn't happen because her piano player pulled out at the last moment and um, I brought this guy in called Neil Carley who I didn't know, I knew of him and she never met and it could have gone disastrously wrong but we actually got it in the first take. I've been walking in the same way as I did. Two people who've never met before, it was an incredible thing to witness because he literally started playing and she joined in and we used that take and it just had everything. Despite the single only being released on vinyl, Hometown Glory starts to create a buzz louder than a bumblebee with Elephant Titus, leading Kanye West to post it on his Twitter account stating, This sh is dope. Nice. Thanks, Kanye. As a result, she's heard by the producers of Later with Jules Holland, who are so impressed they invite her to perform on the show alongside editors, Bjork, and some other bloke called Paul Frickin' McCartney. This was a huge deal for her because she'd grown up watching Jules Holland with her mother. But she was absolutely terrified as well. You can see how nervous she is when you watch that back. And just as the buzz surrounding Tottenham's finest couldn't get any louder, she was announced as the winner of the Critics' Choice Award at the Brits. What impact do you hope this will have, this Brit Award win? Um, make my bathroom look nicer. <laughs> I'm joking. All this after just one single released on vinyl, the Adele ball had officially started rolling. I love the fact that potentially the world might not have had the voice, the superstar that is Adele because she presumed that all agents and record labels emailing her were merely internet perverts. <laughs> Dean, I imagine you know how that feels. You're going to get a slap. Okay, right, okay, okay. Um, just how unprecedented is it for someone to have such huge success, get such critical acclaim off one little song on a piece of vinyl? It's completely unheard of. I mean, I think the thing about Adele is, is that when she came, people immediately realised it wasn't just a pop puppet. This is a lyricist. This is someone that can write. It's all from the heart. People believe it instantly. And it just escalated. They knew that they were onto a massive winner. So, Lucy, even if Adele had believed that all these record labels were bona fide, she still picked the right one in Excel. Would you agree? 
You do wonder what would have happened if she'd signed to a label like Simon Cowell's label and where that would have gone. But Excel is so cool and they pride themselves in being producers first rather than managers. So they let their artists kind of do what they want, which is what Adele needed. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, so she's just secured a record deal, but now she really needs to start the hard work. I mean, it's not just like you're going to have an overnight success all over the world, is it? I mean, that just doesn't happen, does it? Does it? Riding on the hype, Adele gets ready to release her debut album at the beginning of 2008. Her label had high hopes for the album, called simply 19. However, the recording sessions and working with new producers and co-writers wasn't always easy. So we spent the first day pretty much not really getting anywhere, you know, trying some things out, but it didn't really, really, really work. It was only on the second day when we sort of went, well, you know what, we haven't really got much to lose, that then, you know, suddenly there's a bit more trust, there's a bit more gain. Okay, well, what about this? And then, bang, cold shoulder got done. For some reason, we started talking a lot about ice skating. And in fact, I've got a weird feeling that we called cold shoulder to begin with Bolero. The British take her to their hearts instantly and the album goes to number one, receiving critical acclaim and is nominated for more or less every lofty award going, including the prestigious Mercury Music Prize. The year that um, 19 came out, it got into the Mercury Prize shortlist, which I know a little bit about because I was one of the Mercury judges that year. The feeling within the panel was there was a real promise and potential here. There was good songwriting, there was great musicianship, there was a fantastic singer at the heart of this record. However, breaking America proves harder, but that all changed after she appeared on iconic show Saturday Night Live on the same night as US political plonker Sarah Palin. There'd been some spoof um, comedy sketches of Sarah Palin done by Tina Fey. So the episode of Saturday Night Live which Adele was booked to perform was to feature for the first time a sort of head to head between Sarah Palin and Tina Fey. It was just meant to be like a normal show, just like me and Josh Brolin and I was the musical guest and he was hosting it. And then we w walked in on Saturday and Sarah Palin was there. We were like, oh God, what? <laughs> and um, it ended up being a huge show. 15 million American viewers tune in because they want to see what Sarah Palin's going to make of this. And they also see Adele performing two songs. Soon after, the album rises to number 11 stateside and goes on to sell 6 million copies and win two Grammys. Who said Breaking America was hard? Whenever I've heard that saying, like overnight success, I was like, yeah, whatever, you've got a proper, proper work for it. And it was overnight, literally overnight, so, um, yeah, I was trapped with that. Always a humble girl, Adele says she owes her whole career to Sarah Palin. Well, at least someone likes, eh? Who'd have thought it? Adele, the only woman in the world with more than three teeth that actually wanted to see Sarah Palin in office at the White House. <laughs> Dean, British artists and bands have always done kind of well in the States. Do you think Adele led the way for the new generation of, of British artists breaking America? Completely. I think there was a door that had definitely gone pretty much closed. You know, the Spice Girls had a blip. And then Adele basically went and went, right, I'm going to open the door right up. And then One Direction, The Wanted, Cher Lloyd's now broken America. They're all coming through. Close the door! Yeah. Quickly, close the door! <laughs> Stop it! We love Cher. Um, but she's done really well. And if it wasn't for Adele, you know, really making a second Brit invasion, the biggest invasion since the Beatles, uh -huh. then we wouldn't have had all of this chart success. Totally agree. So at this stage, it would be fair to say that Adele's glass is definitely half full. However, as we're about to find out, it soon becomes clear that some guy came along and slurped down the remains of her glass and then he spat it out on the floor. Here comes two of Dean's favourite things. Yes, heartbreak and homesickness. Despite the massive success of 19, after a few months on the road, Adele becomes increasingly homesick and misses her London-based family and friends. So it was the first time she was away from home for a long time. She really missed family and friends and um, didn't, wasn't sure whether she wanted to do sort of long tours anymore because she just couldn't bear being away from everyone. As a result, she quits her US tour. But it wasn't just homesickness that was getting her down, but also a heavy dose of heartache after breaking up with a mystery boyfriend. And when it came to shooting the video for Make You Feel My Love, it was clear that Adele wasn't in a very happy place. Who knows? what happened in between that first album and that second album and I don't know what happened I know that she didn't seem very happy and that I had to cut short her tour to the States and come back 
Uh, but, uh, you know, when we sat down and thought of the idea for the video, we were trying to address that, you know. I didn't want to put her in a, you know, in a, in a cat suit and have her doing cartwheels or anything. When the rain is blowing in your face And the whole world I want to be diplomatic, but literally, every take <laughs> she did, she then disappeared. <laughs> for a bag and a bottle of beer. She seemed to be quite thirsty at the time. But, you know, hot lights, one gets thirsty. Little did anybody know that this heartbreak was destined to inspire the future songs of 21. But thankfully, it wasn't all sadness on set as director Matt made one fundamental error due to an emotional atmosphere. In the two years since I uh, made this video, the fact that I used my own mobile phone number in the video. So I get calls every day uh, from little kids. Uh, the first call that they make, they usually hang up. The second call, they say, is a doubt there, is a doubt there. And the third call, usually they sing to me. Most of them think I'm an ex-boyfriend that's done her a terrible wrong. Messages today. Okay, so who's this? Get six or seven of those a day. Hello, I need to speak to you. Was you once Ad Adel's ex-boyfriend? Please answer if you calls. Hi, my email address, please call. Epic <laughs> for putting your number on the Adele video. <laughs> That's it, I've just got to respect that, haven't it? Because I am, I am. <laughs> I'm really stupid. Oh, glad he got my last message. <laughs> Um, one man's meat is another man's poison. The lovely Matt there, it's just a nightmare for him that 50 million people have seen his phone number. Dean, that's your dream come true, isn't it? Imagine how popular I'm Dean. At long last, at long last. Um, Lucy, joking aside, uh, this is a very pivotal moment in Adele's career. It must have been such a tough time for her. Well, you can see in that video, because she's going through the heartache then, she's, she's not an actress and she just looks really miserable. It's completely heartbreaking that she split up with this boyfriend and everyone's just obsessed with who he is and we're pretty sure we found him, but again... Of course you have, that's why you're yeah. in the calf. But again, it's down to the respect that he clearly has for her, that he hasn't gone out and talked about it himself and she's been pretty vocal and, you know, and people genuinely feel that there's a bit of hatred for him because they love Adele and they want to know who this person is yeah. that, that has hurt her feelings so badly. Uh, that's it for part two. Still to come, find out what this is all about. Whoa, you just said that. Happy texting, viewers. The whole of the Richmond rugby team. Extraordinary. Hello there and welcome back to Real Stories. Adele, the incredible rise to stardom of the most amazing woman ever to come out of Tottenham. And here to help me devour her past are the sensational pairing of Heat's Lucy Cave and the Sunday Mirror, Dean Piper. Could I be any more over the top? So far we've had some love, laughs and even a bit of politics in the shape of that moose shooting mad woman from Alaska, Sarah Palin. But it's not just her music that people love. Adele, I mean, not, not Palin's. The entire, the, the whole... By 2009, 19 had sold 6 million copies, but those expecting tales of diva demands of Mariah proportions were left disappointed. <laughs> no, I'm a diva with people I work with, not people I don't know. When I first met Adele, I walk into this office, Adele is sitting behind a desk, swinging on her publicist's chair. Slap the table went, all right, love, come and sit down. And I thought, who's this woman? I remember a brilliant um, bit where she was talking about waking up drunk one morning and she had a bit of cream egg stuck to her leg, um, which is not the kind of thing a lot of new pop stars would talk about. In an age of vacuous and plastic image-obsessed pop stars, Adele's breakthrough is like a breath of fresh air, and there's more chance of a Michael Jackson collab than her letting the success go to her head. So keen was she to keep a grasp on reality that she even got a day job between albums. Adele had been coming to the shop for a long time. I've known her manager, Jonathan, for years and years. And he came in one day and said, this is after he, she'd recorded the first album, he came and said, could Adele do work experience in the shop? Yeah, that's fine, no problem at all. So Adele comes in and I say, I say OK, that's fine, you can come and work here. Th we'll work, pick a day, Thursday's OK. Yeah, that's fine. Can't do next Thursday, playing the Hollywood Bowl. <laughs> OK, that's fine, you can miss next Thursday then. 
You can see she was out in the back office doing processing, checking in stock, processing stock, pricing up stuff. She just mucked in with the rest of us. The, the toilets are disgusting and she swore a lot. That's about it. The the with a mouth fouler than a fish trawler's hull on a hot day, your average interview is more like a chat with Ray Winston than Katie Mellor. <laughs> in school, there was definitely the same potty mouth Londoner that, it, that you get now, and I love that because she hasn't changed. You meet her, and within about 40 seconds, she's giving it the, you know, the full-on Sid James. <laughs> Of course, now it's her trademark. As soon as the world was introduced to Adele, it was clear she wasn't your usual pop star and refused to fit to the stereotype of being a pencil-thin pinner. I've never seen magazine covers and seen music videos and been like, I need to look like that if I want to be a success. She's real and she comes across real in every situation that she is in in life. If she doesn't feel like doing something, she won't sing a song that she doesn't want to sing. She won't wear something she doesn't want to wear and I think that's really, really good. And a lot of young girls can look up to that. However, not everyone's impressed by her non-conformity, as when Halloween face fashion designer Cole Lagerfeld came out claiming she was too fat. Adele's gorgeous. You know, anyone who slates her physically is, is an idiot. They say, oh, she's really big, maybe compared to sort of stick thin pop stars, but actually she's very much like just a normal shaped girl. Lagerfeld was lampooned from all directions, from Madonna to Alan Carr, who labelled Lagerfeld as a vile old queen, saying, if I see him, I'd rip his grey hair off the top of his prune face. Ouch. I'm glad we're all friends of Alan Carr. <laughs> we want to get on the wrong side of him. I want to tell if you're watching, he's still short of a few, Bob. Uh, the cafe owner, Boris, is looking for a new waitress. So just call me and I'll put in a good word for you. Um, Lucy, what does this say about a woman that we're already desperately in love with? That she sold six million albums worldwide and she's still happy to get a little day job in a record shop. It just makes you fall in love with her even more, doesn't it? Yeah, Only yeah. Adele would be genuinely working in a record shop. There'd be other pop stars that would use it as a photo opportunity. Katy Perry would be in there just for the cameras, but not really working, doing the accounts and Can I have next Thursday off on playing yeah. the Hollywood Bowl? I know, how brilliant is that? But part of, part of it is because she doesn't think so much of herself that she thinks, I know everything now, I'm a successful artist. She's trying to soak up the atmosphere and know how to write even better records than she does already. Dean, a uh, one third of Stu, she is alluding to it there in our last film. She really is a great role model for the, f the next generation of pop stars. She sticks by her guns, she does what she wants to do, she's got a good family life. Would you agree with that? She doesn't have to do sexy. She doesn't have to flash this, flash that. She's never going to be Rihanna. She doesn't care about that. But she's got soul. she got soul. And that's the difference. She's also got a Saturday job. Um, <laughs> now it's time for the next chapter of Adele's life as her fame skyrockets from about a, well, on the Berry scale, we'll put it a 4 out of 10 to around a 17. The 19th of January 2011 will be remembered for two cataclysmic events. Not only was it Dolly Parton's 66th birthday, happy birthday Dolly, but it was also the day that Adele's second album hit and then subsequently flew off the shelves by the skip load. There's a fire starting in my heart. Called 21, as the name suggests, it was a progression from 19 in almost every way. 21, um, she had expanded as any great artist would. She was working with different writers, different musicians, different producers. And one of the most important new members working with Adele in the studio was Louis. Well, Louis the dog, he was around uh, on my sessions towards the end of the, the second album. And he made his presence felt. Um, and we had to have someone permanently on the door to make sure that he didn't get trapped between the studio and the control room, which would have gone down rather badly. As well as Louis, she also worked with several new producers, including bearded rock legend Rick Rubin and One Republic frontman Ryan Tedder. I met Adele in the lobby of the, of the London Hotel in West Hollywood, all coming back from the Grammys. She had just won and was holding a huge bouquet of balloons and trying to figure out how to navigate into the elevator with all these balloons. She had a short list of four or five writers that she wanted to work with on her next album and I was on that list. And six months later we were in the studio and I think Turning Tables was the first song that we did. I can keep up with your turning tables under your thumb I can breathe. I was laying in bed with my laptop kind of on me and going over the song and so I emailed her. I said I just listened to Turning Tables and I'm, I have goosebumps from head to toe. She wrote back and she said, I'm so glad you feel that way because I'm sitting in my room in my apartment crying, listening to this song on repeat and I can't stop crying. Well, even in the 
midst of like all the heartbreak and turmoil, she was she was cracking jokes and kind of kind of like the jokes on him. <laughs> they were pretty ballsy, man. I was I was always just like, whoa, you just said that. That's amazing. The album's an instant hit in almost everywhere that had people with functioning ears. But just when you thought she couldn't tug any more heartstrings, she sings at the Brits performing someone like you. Backstage at the Brits, when she performed someone like you, it was amazing. Everyone came out of their dressing rooms and was watching it on the screen, and I mean everyone. Robbie Williams, Kylie Minogue, all standing together in silence, just taking it in. When I watched her performance of someone like you at the Brits, I cried, um, as I think the whole nation did. Never mind, I'll find someone like it was such an emotional moment. Um, when the glitter came down and she herself, you know, welled up with tears. You could literally hear a pin drop. It was so quiet backstage at the Brits. It was never quiet. And it was just a wonderful moment. And then the roar of the crowd when she finished, it literally was like a thousand lions. It was, it was amazing. It was funny because the reaction afterwards was people were so overwhelmed by her power, by how amazing she'd been, they were quite shy. So she walked down the corridor and some people would turn away as if she couldn't make eye contact with Adele, but other people were just high-fiving her. You could just hear her cackle all the way down the corridor. Amazing. It was enough to make a grown man weep, but also get the album to number one in 26 countries and make Adele the biggest star in the world. And what about the roar was like a thousand lions, old Goldie Rocks. If only everyone else could talk in similes like you. Sounds more like Keats than a TV presenter. Um, so, Lucy, uh, aside from Goldie Roxy's wonderful use of imagery, what else was so amazing about Adele's performance of someone like you at the Brits? It was just so quiet. It wasn't anyone on stage. I think Rihanna was on stage that same year, and she had kind of pyrotechnics, everything. And she was just stood there with a piano, and that was where the power came. And I think... Whenever you see Adele perform, it, there's this real vulnerability about her. She she breaks down into tears herself, and I don't think even when we're watching that clip there, it just it does make you well up. I don't know what it is. I'm actually weighing up telling this next little anecdote because I think I might cry on my own TV show, which would be very embarrassing. But I uh, was hosting the Brits that year backstage, and uh, I spoke to Adele just after she came off stage, and I was talking to her about the performance and the effect that it had on everybody. She started to cry, which started to set me off. And even just telling this story now. I was like, I no, I'm not, even, I'm not even having this one up, boys and girls. Um, but Dean, let's move on swiftly. Yeah. Dean, you were there. What was it like to be in the room? Let's talk about more crying. <laughs> it's horrible, isn't it? I saw her just before. We were, we were having a chat, and she was literally shaking like a leaf. She was like, this is going to be like win or lose. She, there was no in between. Wow. And then we were actually sat on the first table, so right in front of her. And she said that she looked down at the press table, and we're all sat there just wiping <laughs> tears away. She said, I looked down at you lot, and I bloody started crying. <laughs> you know, and so, you know, you get where it all came from on the night. I mean, it was truly, it, it made her intergalactic. It can change everything in her career. And as we're establishing on Real Stories here today, it couldn't happen to a nicer person. Not. Now, I know what you're thinking back home. Yeah, yeah, I'm loving this emotional insight into Adele. Dave Berry's nearly in tears. But where are the stats? The stats, damn it. Well, fear not, ye old stat munchers. Here they are. And they're pretty impressive. That's right, ye old stat munchers. Thank you. As 21 continues to sell, it wins a plethora of awards, but nothing confirms her world domination more than winning six Grammys in one night, a record only matched by the mighty Beyonce. It's pretty uh, intense being up on that stage and staring back at the whole audience, and everyone was so happy for Adele that I was, I was like secondhand feeling all the all the energy and love that was being projected at Adele. I was directly behind her, so it was kind of hitting me in the process, and uh, it's kind of buzzing for the next hour or so. She's the toast of the world and Tottenham, and as the album keeps selling, she starts to break record after record. 21 is indeed the fifth biggest selling album in the UK of all time. The only albums above it are Queen's Greatest Hits, The Beatles, Sgt Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, 
Apple Gold and What's the Story Morning Glory by Oasis. I heard at one point she was out selling the rest of the British music industry combined. 21 sold more than 3 million copies in one calendar year. It is the biggest selling album of the 21st century. It's the biggest selling digital album and it holds the record for the most consecutive weeks at number one for a solo female artist. Even now they're still buying 21. I, I can't believe there's anybody left in the world who hasn't got it but they do actually still come in and buy it. And all this helps Adele become one of the richest pop stars in the world. Adele's become eligible for the Sunday Times Rich List by being one of the richest young people aged 30 and under. To accumulate 20 million pounds at the tender age of 24 in just over three years is unprecedented in the music industry. Just why the album has proved so popular is unknown. If people knew why albums went like that, they'd make them all the time. It's very hard to understand why an album just crosses over. Well, it was until this chap claimed he'd found a mathematical formula for Adele's success. The score of a song is computed as a linear combination of several feature values that are automatically extracted from the audio of the music. Now, these feature values, they relate to um, a very basic aspect such as the duration. Turning you down. Turning you down. I don't like you. That's why you're never going to love. <laughs> <laughs> so, Lucy, I think I know the answer to this question already. But has all of the success and all of the wealth changed Adele in any way? No, it has not. There is no one more down to earth than Adele. She still buys her pants from Primark. She'd still <laughs> rather sit in the pub with her mates than go to the gym. And it's a brilliant story. When she was on stage, she'd cut her finger and she was performing. She couldn't find a plaster. Just put a tampon on the end of it. That's how down to earth she is. <laughs> and she did. Yeah. I need to see the end of that anecdote coming. <laughs> <laughs> Not in a million years. Well, on that note, I think we should say that's part three done and dusted. We'll see you in a couple of minutes where we'll see why she finally feels the need to say this. I'm sorry if I offended anyone, but the pursuit's offended me. Oh, dear. <laughs> Put the kettle on, Dean. Welcome back to Real Stories, where today we're dissecting the life and times of Adele via the aids of those that have seen her bloom from a gobby school kid into a mighty megastar that we all know and love this very day. And helping me with all this is these two. Yes, we are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good, I'm glad I'm in safe hands. So with 21 still riding high in every chart in the world, apart from Tibet and Equatorial Guinea, it's safe to say that she's doing pretty well. Everything's great, isn't it? Nothing can surely go wrong for the girl. Nothing at all. I mean, what could possibly happen? Huh? Huh? Oh. It's always the way, isn't it? Just when you think you're the biggest pop star in the world and are unstoppable, something comes along to trip you up. But it's not normally your own throat. She's diagnosed with a vocal cord hemorrhage and cancels her tour, first in July and then again in November. We went to the show that supposedly was the one that blew out her vocals. I could tell from the opening song I turned to my wife, I said, she has laryngitis. Something, something's wrong. I, like, I know her voice and something is off right now. Under doctor's orders, she stopped smoking, drinking, eating spicy food and even talking in an attempt not to damage her precious pipes permanently. I had a notepad and I also had an application on my phone and that you type the words into and then it speaks it. But with the best medical advice around and not to mention a little support from every celeb in needs best friend Elton John, she was back on the mend in no time. Only problem being that the British press can't seem to get enough of the world's newest superstar. You had this massively successful album that had sold two million copies in a blink of an eye. And then almost immediately you got some of the more unpleasant sides of, of fame. Rumour has it he's the one I'm leaving you for. But most painful of all is when her estranged father sells his story to the press. The tabloids tracked him down and he, he, he sold a story about her, talked about her when she was young. Adele was absolutely furious that he'd done this. You know, it was a real invasion of her, her privacy. Adele's reaction is typically blunt as she states, I was actually ready to start trying to have a relationship with him. He's blown it. He will never hear from me again. If I ever see him, I will spit in his face. And just to top the year off after winning two Brits, TV funny man James Corden cuts her off mid-speech in what should have been her finest hour on home soil. Got cut off during my speech for best album and I uh, flung the middle finger. But that finger was to the suits of the Brit Awards, not to my fans. I was about to thank the British public for all of their support and they cut me off. Um, so I'm sorry if I offended anyone. And with that, Adele puts the most successful and traumatic 12 months behind her. But what will the future hold? Like you're all thinking, 
Good old Sir Elton John. He really is there for all the celebrities. Well, Elton John, where were you when I needed you? Where were you during Squirrel Gate? That's my question. Um, Lucy, Dean, why... I, I don't want to get on the wrong side of you guys, but what is your problem? When someone becomes a true superstar, you guys and all those around you do your best to hound them out of the country. Is it unfair on them, or should they just learn to live with it and it's part that goes with being rich and famous? I think that people are genuinely interested in Adele because they feel that they can relate to her and they listen to her songs and they feel that they know her. So it's almost a bit of a, it's a bit of a dilemma for her because she bears her soul in this music and so she knows people have that connection. Yet she she doesn't want to be a celebrity, and I, I do think people also, respect that. Yeah, and also she's in a really fortunate position of being able to move on in a different way to a lot of celebs. She can literally go away, get on with her life. Then when she comes back, she's not taking hundreds of thousands of pounds and doing interviews and doing TV things. She'll do it when she's got something to, pr to promote. But she won't just do it because she wants to be a celeb. So she has actually got the ball in her court. Nice. Yeah. I like the ball being in Adele's court. And well handled there. Yeah, I chucked my hardest yeah, journalistic really questions at you. Yeah. This was my Frost Nixon. <laughs> uh, and you handled it very well, both of you. Well done. Uh, and that is that. We have now caught up with the present day. But now it is time to go all Marty McFly and go even further and see what the future holds for this mighty woman. So, where next for the world's biggest pop star? It seems she's put the heartbreak of 21 behind her and she's happily in a relationship with charity organiser Simon Konecki. In July, it was announced that she was going to be a mother and wanted to take five years off before her new album. Given what a roller coaster four years she's had and she's sort of taken on so many new things and extraordinary experiences, I mean, I think probably motherhood is just going to be the next in line. She's been in the public eye now for how many years it is now, from, from her formative years and actually having some time for herself to do what she wants and write when she feels like it and feels inspired, I think would be a really good idea. I think she'll just take time out for herself and her baby and her family, and I think, I, I think she should. I think she deserves it. But the question remains, can a happy Adele still write hit records? All her songs have been about sort of trauma of, of relationships ending and, and what that does to you and how you get over it. She might reform herself and start singing love songs about fairy tale endings and not broken hearts. I'm madly in love and I don't want to um, I don't want to be like babe, I'm sorry, I've got to break up, I've got a new album to deliver. <laughs> I think she's got staying power. One of the reasons I think she has is because she understands the industry. She she knows how to get what she wants out of the career she's created for herself. The thing that is amazing is that this this young naive girl of 18, I think, when I first met her, is now one of the most famous women in the world. And, but she still, you know, remains very normal and down to earth, and I think that's incredible. So that's that. It brings us up to the present day. Dean, Adele is stating that she's going to take a good five years off before her next record. Do you think that's feasible? Nah. <laughs> OK, thanks, Dean. <laughs> Let's wrap it's, it up there. It's definitely not going to happen. Um, she's already, after that comment which came out, and then she, she kind of backtracked and said, oh, well, I'm working. She was in the studio like a week after that comment. Skyfall, James Bond, theme tune. She's going to sing the theme tune. It's going to be huge, obviously. I think until we get the next album, that'll be quite a while. Uh, Lucy, she seems very happy now. I know we touched on it there in the film, but do you think Adele is capable of writing the kind of songs that are going to captivate the imagination and hearts of the world if she's a happy little bunny? She says herself that when she's happy, she can't think of anything to write, and she's too busy <laughs> out having fun. But I hope she's joking. She's so talented. Of course she can think of something to write. We, we can do Happy Adele, can't we? Certainly can. Um, I think it's time that we get our predictions. What do you think? It's been quite a journey on Real Stories uh, today. Dean, what do you think the future holds? Will people will still be buying tickets to see her perform live. I mean, I don't she's think she's real... ever going to be a live artist. I don't think she's going to go on the road for months and months. It's going to be a real event when she does stuff. She wants to have a normal life and just live. If she does an album, it's a bonus point for us. That's the way I look at it. Well, and then pop up in Vegas in a few years. Do, do exactly. a gig. Uh, what about you, Lucy? Maybe she'll release an album of uh, 
If swear words if she can't think of anything else. Potty mouth Adele. All I can say is that I'm really looking forward to the future albums, 33, featuring the global smash hit single Rolling in the Hardware Store. Just pop down there to get some garden furniture. Uh, the brilliant 64 and a half, and of course the posthumous release of Unheard Outtakes 106. No. And those thoughts bring real stories of Dell to a neat conclusion. Lucy and Dean, thank you both so much for your insight. We've been from the streets of Tottenham to the red carpets of the Grammys, albeit via West Norwood. It's been a moving adventure. <laughs> thank you all for tuning in. Goodbye. <laughs>